and welcome to lecture number 10 in our physiological psychology series. Today we're going to be talking about brain damage and neuroplasticity. So to start off we're going to talk about what we mean by this idea of plasticity or neuroplasticity and essentially we're talking about the brain's ability to heal and reorganize itself in response to trauma. We'll talk a little bit about types of brain injuries, recovery from brain injury, and a little bit about cortical reorganization. So what do we mean by plasticity? Well, almost all survivors of brain damage show behavioral recovery to some degree. A lot of this is related to the age at which you might have a brain injury. The general rule is the younger you are, uh, the more uh, complete your recovery is likely to be. So the younger you are, the more plastic your brain is, as we say. It's the reason why we have things like critical periods. As your brain starts to develop, uh, certain sections of the brain start to set up during these critical periods. So if you're before one of these critical periods, your brain is pretty good at reorganizing itself to compensate for any damage. So some recovery in uh, adults relies on the growth of new branches of axons and dendrites, and we'll talk a little bit about that process. Understanding the process of recovery will give us new and improved therapies. So as we try to understand this from a research perspective, that's why this is an important topic. Some of the mechanisms of recovery include those similar to the mechanisms of brain development, such as the new, new branching of axons and dendrites, as well as neurogenesis. And we certainly know children have greater brain, brain plasticity and recovery from injury uh, much better than adults. There's sort of some very classic case studies. There's a uh, young lady who, um, who's an adult now who had one of her hemispheres removed uh, for uh, ep epilepsy surgery as a child uh, and developed perfectly normal intelligence, went to college. Um, she was obviously paralyzed on one side because she was missing that uh, side of her brain, but uh, perfectly uh, normal intellectual development because it happened so young. So that's what we mean by plasticity. I want to spend a little bit of time, though, talking about types of brain injuries uh, because I think this is important just from a, a way of understanding uh, how people's brains can get injured and understanding you know, what the uh, various processes involved here are. So we'll start with brain tumors. There are four different grades of tumors based on the World Health Organization grading criteria. Grades four three and four, sorry, are what we call malignant tumors, or tumors that reproduce rapidly. Uh, grade one and two are relatively slow-growing uh, tumors, so they're what we call the least malignant, 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 I'm having a hard time saying that. Um, these malignant brain tumors are most commonly caused by metastatic cancer, which simply means that the cancer has spread from its original location to different locations. In particular, small cell lung cancer and melanoma are the most common causes of brain tumors, particularly these kind of brain tumors. So what can happen is a cancer cell will break off from the lungs, travel up into the brain, get caught in the blood vessels in the brain, and then start forming a tumor. Um, other ways in which tumors can develop is a primary brain tumor, like a glioblastoma, um, which is a uh, cancer of the glial cells. So treatments for uh, brain tumors can include surgery, uh, depending on the location. So there are a couple of different ways to do that. Obviously, if the tumor is located near the surface of the brain, um, that's a relatively straightforward procedure. Uh, just remove part of the skull, um, go in, take the tumor out, put the skull back on, and the skull injury is actually the, the thing that takes the longest to recover from. Uh, for some tumors that are located deeper in the brain, they can actually go through um, the nasal passages, for example. Um, I have a relative who had a, um, what's called Cushing's disease, which is a, a tumor of the hypothalamus or in the hypothalamic area, and actually removed that by going through her nose, uh, up through her uh, into her sinus passages, uh, drilling a hole there on the base of the skull and removing the tumor that way. Uh, other types of Treatments include stereotactic radiation surgery, which includes the gamma knife, uh, and then the cyber knife procedure is a type of radiation surgery uh, that doesn't require the stereotactic device. So the gamma knife uh, looks something like this. A uh, person has to have their head restrained, or at least this helmet, so it's all always 
So that's why it's called a stereotactic device, because it attaches essentially to the skull, uh, the outside of the skull, and keeps the radiation constantly on uh, this uh, single target. So this would be something like the gamma knife, which uh, gets radiation along several different pathways to get a high dose of radiation at the target, but lower doses along the pathway so as to not damage that tissue. The cyber knife follows the same principles, but is actually a little bit more advanced because it can actually track where the tumor is, and if the person moves their head, then it adjusts accordingly. So you can see here, this is what the device looks like. We have x-ray sources that take images, compare it to their CT scan data to check the that the radiation beams are locked on the tumor. The linear accelerator then generates high-dose radiation beams, which significantly reduces treatment time for patients. Uh, they lie here for about 30 to 60 minutes, and then the targeting system tracks the tumors while compensating for normal patient movements to minimize radiation exposure to surrounding healthy tissue. So it keeps that radiation dosage right here on the um, tumor itself, and you can see these are the pathways uh, that the radiation is taken to try to get at that uh, patient's tumor. So this is a really advanced um, technique uh, that is particularly been shown to be good for uh, treating these sort of deeper brain uh, tumors. Um, <coughs> the next most common, or so actually the most common uh, type of brain injury is actually ischemic stroke. Um, a stroke or cerebral vascular accident is any temporary loss of blood, blood flow to the brain. This is a common cause of brain injury in the elderly, primarily through what we call ischemic stro stroke. So in ischemia, this is the most common type of stroke resulting from a blood clot or obstruction of an artery. What happens is the neurons lose their oxygen and glucose supply and as a result uh, end up dying. An aneurysm, cerebral bleeding, or subdural hematoma occur when there is a hemorrhage in the brain. So this is a less frequent type of stroke resulting from a ruptured artery. Uh, neurons are flooded with excess blood, calcium, oxygen, and other chemicals. Subdural hematomas put increased pr pressure on the brain. This is usually caused by a closed head trauma uh, in which uh, the blood vessels in the subdural space have ruptured, and as a result, that blood starts to pool and put pressure on the brain. This requires usually immediate surgical treatment. Aneurysms are caused by weakened blood vessels which bulge and then rupture. The problem with aneurysms is they often go undiagnosed, and this is uh, oftentimes can be instantly fatal. So we're talking about this kind of bulge in this blood vessel. will keep expanding uh, until it ruptures and it can be almost like a little bomb going off in the brain. Uh, very damaging uh, to the brain. So that's something um, that oftentimes, as I said, goes undiagnosed and uh, oftentimes can be um, quite damaging. So the effects of these strokes, both ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, uh, are edema, which is the accumulation of fluid in the brain, resulting in increased pressure on the brain and increasing the probability of further strokes. We also get disruption of the sodium-potassium pump, leading to the accumulation of potassium ions inside neurons. This edema and excess potassium triggers the release of glutamate. This then overstimulates neurons, which leads to sodium and other ions entering the neuron in excessive amounts. And then these excessive positive ions in the neuron block metabol metabolism in the mitochondria and can kill the neuron. So we talked a little bit about um, this process when we talked about um, the action potential and this uh, buildup of sodium in the uh, neuron, which can be quite damaging to the neuron. So how do we treat strokes? Well, if it is a uh, ischemic stroke, this can be treated with a drug called tissue uh, plasminogen activator, or TPA, which breaks up blood clots and can reduce the effects of ischemic strokes. One of the most effective laboratory methods has been used to, damage, to minimize damage caused by strokes is to actually cool down the brain. Uh, and what appears to happen is cooling protects the brain after ischemia by reducing overstimulation, apoptosis, and inflammation. So we get reduction in that edema, reduction in that cellular rupturing, rupturing caused by uh, that increase of uh, sodium. Interestingly, there's some research that cannabinoids uh, have also been shown to potentially minimize cell losses after a brain stroke. And in the laboratory research, what they have shown is that uh, in 
uh, rodent models, uh, mouse and rat models, uh, they see that they get the most protection from ischemic stroke for people for the animals that have been exposed to cannabis prior to the stroke. And so there may be some health benefits to smoking cannabis or consuming cannabis um, related to uh, decreased um, cell loss after stroke. So that's uh, an interesting point there. Another area uh, in which there are a great deal of uh, variables to consider are infectious diseases. But generally speaking, bacteria and viruses are capable of infecting the brain and surrounding tissues. Uh, when we talk about meningitis, we're generally talking about an infection of the membrane surrounding the brain, which is the meninges. The most dangerous cause of meningitis is the meningococcal bacteria, which can mostly be prevented by vaccination. So most college students have been vaccinated for meningitis uh, because it is <coughs> oftentimes endemic to college campuses. And so uh, it's a particularly good idea to get uh, vaccinated for this. Encephalitis is infection and inflammation of the brain. Um, some common causes of this are West Nile, <coughs> sorry, West Nile virus. As we move into spring and summer, this starts to become more uh, risky and certainly a more common cause of infection. Uh, herpes simplex and HIV infection uh, during seroconversion uh, or in untreated HIV patients can also cause a swelling of the brain and encephalitis. Other infections uh, that can influence or affect the brain include Lyme disease, which has particularly um, dramatic effects. Again, we're moving into Lyme disease season. It's caused by deer ticks. West Nile is, of course, spread by um, mosquitoes. Uh, the most <coughs> dramatic of the brain infections include rabies uh, and prion diseases. Rabies is, of course, um, hydrophobia, uh, which uh, during initial exposure, if someone is exposed to rabies, they can receive treatment. Uh, and be just fine, but once they are symptomatic, generally treatment uh, is too late. And so uh, anytime you think you may have been at risk for being exposed to rabies, particularly um, if you find something like bats in your house, uh, bats are highly prone to have rabies, um, or if you uh, have an animal that has been exposed to rabies, you certainly want to, or a dog bite, any of those things, very important to uh, watch out for. Prion diseases are um, primarily things like what we call what we call mad cow disease. In people, this is called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Um, <coughs> prion diseases are particularly problematic because uh, they're, uh, the nature of the prion is that you can't sterilize surgical instruments to get rid of the prion. Uh, it seems to be one of the major problems. And so anyone who's had neurosurgery, they usually have to then just simply discard um, instruments because you can't uh, sterilize uh, instruments and there have been a number of instances where um, instruments have been sterilized but you know, get transfer from one patient to the other of these prion diseases. Uh, very, very rare in human beings uh, but certainly um, quite dangerous. Other ways the brain can get injured is through um, penetrating injuries. These are when damage is caused by an object penetrating both the skull and the dura and into the brain. We get two different kinds of damage in this particular instance. You get damage caused along the path of the object as well as due to skull fragments penetrating the brain. So in a gunshot injury, for example, it's not simply uh, the trajectory of the bullet that's caused injury but also uh, the path of skull fragments as they've entered the brain um, as the a bullet penetrates uh, the skull. So this is um, obviously the damage here depends entirely on the path of the uh, object. In fact, oftentimes you can get these penetrating injuries with very limited overall damage. Um, just some people sometimes get lucky. Or you get other cases. So for example, there's a case of uh, a number of cases actually. I looked in the literature of fencing foils going up people's noses. <laughs> It sounds crazy, but they go up the nose or, or penetrate next to the eye um, and pierce the brain and can cause damage to what are called the mammillary bodies uh, or the hypothalamus. There's a case of an individual developing um, very dense retrograde and anterograde amnesia uh, from that simple injury. 
Uh, then you get other people who have penetrating injuries, um, which with relatively low effects. There's actually an entire show on uh, these kind of injuries called I Was Impaled. So if you have a strong stomach and you have the weird curiosity about it, I would look it up. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, closed head trauma is one of the most common causes of injury. Uh, this is a closed head injury. refers to a sharp blow to the head that does not puncture the brain. This is one of the main causes of brain injury in adults. Um, this is usually due to sports injuries, um, due to car accidents, and of course we also have a significant number of people coming back from battle injuries um, when they have been exposed to something like an imp uh, improvised explosive device or IED where an explosion has gone off near them and they have uh, had this kind of brain injury. After a severe injury, recovery can be, can be very slow and incomplete. Uh, damage to the brain is usually due to diffuse axonal shearing, which is difficult to show on uh, any kind of uh, CT scan or MRI scan, and oftentimes the results are primarily seen in behavior. Lots of research going on in this area about how best to treat these individuals, uh, but the injury is often very slow and uh, not always complete. We'll talk more about uh, closed head trauma when we talk about um, neuropsychology of memory later on in the semester. So, some mechanisms of recovery from brain injury. Well, following brain damage, surviving brain areas increase or, or reorganize their activity. You get what is called diaschesis. This is decreased activity of surviving neurons after damage to other neurons. So as a result, because these neurons aren't uh, being activated, uh, they're not being used at all. It's sort of a user to lose it problem, and so oftentimes you can get increased uh, cell loss because of that. Because activity in one area stimulates other areas, damage to the brain disrupts patterns of normal stimulation. So there are, uh, are possible treatments, things like stimulants may stimulate activity in healthy regions of the brain after a stroke, and as a result you can get establishment of the appropriate pathways and at least not lose more damage by stimulating pathways uh, following a stroke. Uh, one thing we know is that destroyed cell bodies can't be replaced, but damaged axons do grow back under cer certain circumstances. Now that bit about destroyed cell bodies not being replaced is true, but that doesn't mean new neurons can't come and take the place of old neurons. Uh, in fact, uh, that's one of the mechanisms by which we're able to forget things that we don't need to remember. Um, over time is we generate new neurons that then replace old ones. But damaged axons do not re readily regenerate in a mature mammalian brain or spinal cord. A uh, couple of issues here are scar tissue tends to make a mechanical barrier to axon growth. Uh, neurons on the two sides uh, of a cut axon tend to pull apart. And glial cells that react to central nervous system damage release chemicals that inhibit axon growth. So these are all part of the problem when trying to deal with uh, severing of axons. And in particular, uh, the spinal cord, we're talking about very long axons. Uh, so if we have a sever in the spinal cord, uh, trying to fix that um, damage is often very, very difficult. Other mechanisms of brain uh, recovery from brain injury include axonal sprouting. So collateral sprouts are new branches formed by other non-damaged axons that attach to vacant receptors. So cells that have lost their source of innervation release neurotrophins to induce axons to form collateral sprouts. And over several months, the sprouts fill in most vacated synapses and can be useful, neutral, or potentially harmful. So this is where we get some of the problems with this collateral sprouting, is it can be beneficial, or it can be harmful, or neither of the above. So trying to control this process is uh, certainly part of how we're trying to look at trying to fix this kind of brain damage. Uh, denervation supersensitivity occurs when postsynaptic cells that are deprived of synaptic inputs developed increase, develop increased sensitivity to their neurotransmitter to comp compensate for their decreased input. So because they're not receiving input, uh, their sensitivity thresholds um, go down. This is kind of the opposite thing that happens when people become uh, less sensitive to drugs. So when somebody takes cocaine and starts using it a lot, uh, their uh, neurons will become less sensitive to the presence of, of cocaine and so they don't respond as strongly. This is the opposite of that. So they become much more sensitive uh, and require much lower uh, amounts of neurotransmitter in order to respond. 
so denervation or denervation supersensitivity. So this is the heightened seven sensitivity to our neurotransmitter after the destruction of an incoming axon. Uh, one of the things that can result from this is chronic pain. Uh, in fact, this is an area, uh, again, there's a lot of research happening where people are looking at why chronic pain can occur, but you can get people who have highly, highly sensitive skin and can't stand to be touched, can't stand to even wear clothes sometimes because the, the clothes on their skin activate pain receptors because those receptors have become so sensitive following some kind of injury. So usually there's some kind of injury that causes this kind of, potentially causes this kind of chronic pain. Another issue that uh, comes up is uh, what we call cortical reorganization. Uh, after some kind of injury, the cortex can start to uh, re sort of reorganize itself. And one of the things that, that demo that's demonstrated by this is the idea of the phantom limb uh, sensation. So this is simply the continuation of sensation of an amputated body part. So the cortex reorganizes itself after the amputation of a body part by becoming responsive to other parts of the body. So as you can see here in this illustration, the uh, what used to be fingertips, or the fingers of a uh, hand, let's say that that arm is no longer there, are now sensitive to these areas on this gentleman's face. And so if you touch those areas on his face, it feels like his hand is still there. So those original axons degenerate, leaving vacant synapses onto which other axons sprout. So this collateral sprouting results in this nearby facial areas being responsible for that phantom limb area. And when I say nearby, I mean nearby in the cortex. So the phantom limb can lead to the feeling of sensations in the amputated part of the body when these other parts of the body are stimulated. So it's that collateral sprouting that is causing this phantom limb syndrome because touching the face makes it feel like you're touching uh, where uh, the hand used to be in terms of cortical representation. So those neurons responding, uh, providing input uh, to the area of the brain responsible for that hand are no longer providing input and so they sprout over to the nearest areas, which happen to be uh, these areas of the face. Just related to that is this idea of use-dependent plasticity. Following a stroke, patients often show what's called hemiparesis, and as a result, they begin to use their non-affected side more. So hemiparesis is uh, being paralyzed on one side. Uh, this can result in motor cortex reorganization, favoring the non-affected side, and reducing neuronal firing in the affected side. So one of the things that uh, happens with stroke patients is they often use what's called constraint-induced movement therapy. And this is a therapy that is designed to get patients using their affected side. So what you do is you constrain them from using uh, their sort of injured side, or sorry, their non-injured side, and make them use their injured side. So keep them from using, if their right hand is what's affected, you keep them from using that, their left hand, so they have to use their right hand more. And research shows that 12 days of treatment uh, with this kind of constraint-induced movement therapy is effective in recruitment of large numbers of neurons in the stroke-affected extremity. So you can actually get um, some recovery from that stroke by forcing people to use that side of the body that has been damaged through um, the stroke. And so this demonstrates this idea of recovery by, by this use-dependent plasticity. All right, well, that is brain damage and plasticity. Um, we'll be talking next, I believe, about uh, movement and movement disorders. No, nope, sorry, it's vision and visual coding. So we'll be talking about...